Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So there in Matthew 24, look at verse number 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The disciples ask these three questions to Jesus. And, you know, this indicates that the disciples were looking for the end of the world at Christ's coming. And what we're going to look at today is end times prophecy in the Old Testament. Right? The disciples, their point of reference would have been the, the oracles of God, the scriptures, the, the law, the prophets, Moses. And there's so much information about the end times in the Old Testament. We're barely going to scratch the surface today. I mean, there's, there's, I could keep you here for three hours, but you wouldn't like that. You probably wouldn't learn anything. I mean, it's hard enough to keep you guys awake. So we're going to keep it short and concise. I'm going to try to show you some really cool passages that you may not be aware of that, that deal with prophecies of the Lord coming. And, you know, immediately, how does Jesus answer them when they ask these three questions? Look, he says, take heed that no man deceive you. And this is very important because today there are a lot of people that are trying to deceive you about the coming of the Lord. Yeah. They have an agenda. They've changed the scriptures. They're interpreting it weird. They're not taking things in context. They don't know, they don't know where to place Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel. So they come up with a lot of strange versions of when the, the coming of the Lord will be. I want you to turn to Genesis 49 to begin with. Genesis chapter 49. So we're going to be looking at the signs of the end of the world that were foretold from Genesis to Malachi. As I said, this is not exhaustive. There's so much stuff we could look at that I'm actually going to intentionally leave out the major and the minor prophets, and we're going to focus in the other areas of the Bible. Uh, like I said, you could, you could preach for weeks on end about the major and the minor prophets, about the signs, but we're going to look at the places where you may not think, like Genesis, where it literally says it's the end times, the last days, and we're going to see what signs were told, because the, the, the disciples were aware, they were educated enough, they knew the Bible enough to know that when Jesus came, that would be the signs of the end of the world. And a lot of times people ask today, well, are we in the last days? Are we really in the end times? You know, because all the atheists in the world, the scoffers and the mockers, yeah, you Christians have been saying that since the 1800s. Well, look, the Bible has said it even farther back than that. And, you know, from the beginning, God teaches us of his of, of the ending, really. From the beginning, he's teaching of the end, right? He's from everlasting, so he sees the whole picture. And he teaches from the beginning about both salvation and also judgment. He teaches from the beginning about the resurrection of the saints. And keeping this in mind, you know, Jesus dealt with the Sadducees. They didn't even believe in the resurrection. What contrary? Well, we don't believe in the resurrection. Well, it's clearly taught throughout the Bible. And it blows my mind that there's a sect that could say, well, there is no resurrection. And today, frankly, most Christians are weak on the doctrine of the resurrection. They don't know what they believe or they don't entirely understand it all because they have not studied it out for themselves. Listen, we as Christians, you're born again, a Bible-believing Christian, you're eternally secure. You ought to get in the Bible and find out what you believe for yourself. Because Jesus said, let no man deceive you. And those that are deceived about the resurrection or baptism or you know the fruits of the Spirit, things like that, it's because they don't know what the Bible says. They haven't studied it out for themselves. And of course, listen, the, the disciples knew from the Old Testament that Jesus would come to save and to judge. So they see Jesus there. Jesus had not fulfilled his ministry yet. He hadn't finished his work on the earth. And yet they're, they're asking questions about, okay, so when's the world going to end? You're here now, so it's going to wrap up, right? You know, and, and the disciples, kept, they had this mentality of, well, when is the end times beginning is essentially what they're asking. And look, you're in, in Genesis uh, chapter four, uh, 49. Look at verse number 1. It says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. So at the end of Jacob's life, he brings his 12 sons together. He's going to tell them the things that are going to happen in the end of the world, in the last days. He's not just saying the end of his life because that was about to happen, right? That was upon them. And we just read in Matthew 24 where there was a warning of false Christs and earthquakes and pestilences and diseases and world wars everywhere. 
And, you know, the persecution of believers and tribulation, and we see all that in Matthew 24 where Jesus clearly expounded it to them, but these things can also be found in the Old Testament. And the disciples knew that, and they had a picture of it, they had a glimpse of it, but I don't think they had all the answers. I don't think that they understood completely that Jesus was coming twice. And thank God we can see that now. It's more clear now. Jesus very plainly told them that he was coming back. He would come again. And, you know, they, they were thinking of, of, a, of a single event in that he would both save the world and also judge the world. But we don't always understand Scripture clearly until God finishes unraveling it for us. So when, when here when Jacob is saying, what will befall you in the last days? You know, the question comes to mind then. So when is the last days? Right? In Genesis 49, when this is written, it's well over 2,000 years. The earth had been around for about 2,000 years. Right? When Jesus was talking to them in Matthew 24, the earth had been around for well over 4,000 years. And today, in America, right now, this morning, the earth has been around for well over 6,000 years. And you know, I believe, according to the Scriptures, that the end times began with the first coming of Christ. I believe the signs that they were looking for was the coming of Christ, and yet it will be completed with the, the last coming. And obviously we still have the millennium and, and the new heaven, new earth, the, the total end. All those things will still play out. And so in Matthew 24, at his first coming, he's telling them of the second coming. And I believe during that first coming, that was the beginning. That's when the end times actually began. So, you know, in Acts chapter 1, as Jesus is preaching to his disciples right before he ascends to heaven... They asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So, of course, they're saying, okay, Lord, now you've fulfilled your earthly ministry. He's about to ascend into heaven. And what are they asking? Well, what about the judgment of the earth? Right? What about the establishment of your kingdom? What about this dominion that will last forever to come about? Right? So the end times must include these details. The disciples knew about it from the Old Testament anticipating it now i want you to hold your place in genesis 49 I'm going to turn to malachi chapter 4 malachi chapter 4 that's the very last book in the old testament right before matthew in the new testament and again i believe that it's from the first coming to the second and obviously there are things fulfilled at the second with the millennial reign and and that sort of thing in romans 11 it says that blindness in part has happened to israel until the fullness of the gentiles come in He's saying that God was working through a physical nation, but you know that physical nation, they weren't all saved. There was the spiritual nation inside of that physical nation. Well, God has broken down those barriers. He's made it clear the gospel's out to the Gentiles. He goes on, he says, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer. Right? Jesus has came out of the Zion. Jesus will come back to Zion. So that's partially fulfilled. There's more yet to come. And you know, he will return. So it's the first and the second work together. And in Luke chapter 21, which is a parallel to Matthew 24 that we just read, he says, In Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Jesus telling them, hey, when, when will this happen? Hey, when I come back a second time. Right? So what are the end times? I believe that we have a period called the end times that start at Jesus' his first coming. And they begin to end at the second coming. Obviously, at his second coming and the resurrection, there are still, still things that play out before the end of the world so that's not the total end there's still things that god does there but he, he tells us clearly that the time of the gentiles that's when it will be fulfilled that's when everything will happen that he spoke about so when 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 jacob speaks of what's going to happen in the last times the things he's talking about are in a pretty big boundary of several thousand years do you see so so people don't always get that in matthew 11 jesus said and from the days of john the baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was to come. Right? He's saying, hey, this is Elias. This is that Elijah. In 1 Peter 1, Jesus, it says, Jesus Christ was manifest for us in these last times. When was Jesus Christ manifest, manifest in the flesh? At his first coming, right? Beginning the last times. Look, you're in Malachi chapter 4. So we see that we have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament where we, you know, he's clearly telling us the last days come at his first coming. Look at verse number 5. Malachi chapter 4, verse number 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. 
And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and from the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So Jesus is saying, before all these things are fulfilled, you're going to see Elijah coming back, coming right, preparing the way he talks about in other chapters. Go ahead and go back to Genesis 49. Genesis chapter 49. So Jesus, from Genesis to Malachi, from the beginning and end of the Old Testament, he's giving us signs and warnings about the end of the world, about his coming as a savior and also as a king. Now, in Genesis 49, find verse number 10. It says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, right out of the gate, we know that Jesus came out of the lineage of Judah, out of that tribe, but there's two words he uses here. One is scepter, one is lawgiver. Right? A scepter is indicating that Jesus will be king. As lawgiver, it indicates that he will be judge. And of course, we know they mocked Jesus and said, oh, is this the king of the Jews? Right? Now, Jesus didn't deny it, but yet, did, did Jesus sit on a throne on the earth? Did he rule as a lawgiver on the earth? No, not yet. Right? Those things have yet to be fulfilled. And so it makes sense. You know, they knew the Savior would come from God. That was foretold. That was told to um, uh, we see uh, Noah had a covenant, Abraham had a covenant. There's several promises moving along. So we see here that he's saying uh, also until Shiloh come. Now when, when it says until Shiloh come, that's talking about Jesus Christ. Now there are other things named Shiloh later in the Bible that are not this same Shiloh. So don't let that word throw you off. Uh, but then he says at the end, I, I really like this. Look at what he says here. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The gathering of the people. What is he talking about in the gathering of the people? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. The Bible is talking here about the resurrection. right? When he's talking to Jacob, and he's talking about gathering all the believers, even Abraham, who was dead in the flesh, but alive in the spirit, alive in the soul forever, right? when will they all be gathered together? Hey, we'll be there for that day. It's called the gathering together. It's called the coming of the Lord is what it's called. So they knew that when Christ came, he would come as a savior, but he would also come as a king. And maybe they, they couldn't discern the difference between the two initially. I want you to look at verse 24 in this chapter. Genesis 49, verse 24. It says, but his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Right now here, this, this one is not to Judah. However, he's given us an indication about the Savior. He says that it's from thence. From what? From the mighty God of Jacob. Right? So from God, we're going to have this Savior come. He calls him a shepherd and the stone of Israel. The stone of Israel. If you know your Bible, that should, like flags should be going off. Hey, I know of other things where Jesus is the rock of my salvation. Right? You know, in the Testament, they were supposed to speak to the rock to receive salvation. The Bible says that he is the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Right? In the end times, that shepherd will reappear. That chief shepherd will reappear, Jesus Christ, at his second coming. The stone which the builders rejected. So what's the stone of Israel? Jesus Christ. Who is the shepherd and bishop of your soul? Jesus Christ. Right? It says that spiritual rock was Christ. Now turn to Numbers chapter 24. So we see these indications right away in Genesis 49 of Jesus Christ, of His coming, of not only the law giving of, of what you know, we would call the millennial reign, but we also see salvation. We see the gathering together. We see the resurrection. And we can clearly see that now as we look back. Obviously, you know, people didn't always know everything that they know. And, and we, have, we are at an advantage that we have Scriptures revealed to us. As you're turning to... Numbers 24, you know, so in the, in the last days here, they're told there's a, a Savior from God, the gathering together. We know of the everlasting covenant that was preached unto Abraham. So it says he would be a lawgiver. You know, he would judge the earth. And we know that God will pour out his wrath on this earth after the resurrection, after the tribulation. Listen, in old prophecy, Old, time, old Testament prophecy, it includes a glimpse of the first coming and the second coming. 
And sometimes, especially when you're in like Isaiah and Ezekiel, it's hard to discern. Is this the first or the second? Right? Sometimes it's a little bit difficult, and God just wraps it all together to give you the big picture. And, you know, it, it's not always important in context to discern it. But, hey, as a Christian, as a Bible believer, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You ought to be studying these things out. You ought to be sharp with your sword. You ought to be able to, to find these things out for yourself. Listen, he came as a sacrificial savior. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus died for us. He went to hell for us so we don't have to go. He's offered us the free gift of eternal life. All we have to do is put our trust in him. Right? That's the eternal covenant, the everlasting covenant. But he's also going to come as a conquering king. Right? He will put his enemies down. He will put the God-haters down. He will destroy the devil's kingdom, the Antichrist kingdom. He will eliminate the mark of the beast, all those things that play out in the end times. He has a plan. We're going to conquer, you know. And he, he tells us throughout the whole Bible that he will pour out his wrath before the end is completely fulfilled. God will avenge for us. Now, you're in Numbers chapter 24. Find verse number 14. Numbers 24, verse number 14. And now, behold, I go unto my people. Come therefore, and I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. Right? So this is that false prophet that God actually speaks through. God puts him in a trance. God puts his words in his mouth. He was told to, to curse the children of God, and God turned it into a blessing. We know, we know that this guy is not a legitimate prophet of God, but yet in this very unique circumstance, God actually speaks through this man. And he's telling the pagan king what God is going to do to your people at the end of the world. Look at verse 17. At the latter days, it says, right? Verse 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. Right? Now, the star, who is that star? Revelation 22 tells us that he is the root and the offspring of David, that bright and morning star. So we know that the star it's talking about here is Jesus Christ. He's saying, hey, Jesus is going to come. And then he takes it a step farther and says, Jesus is going to judge. Jesus is going to destroy the, the, the ungodly. Again, we saw that the scepter in Genesis 49 is Jesus. We saw that in Numbers 24. It's also in Psalm 45. In Hebrews 1, 8, you guys probably know this one. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. And a scepter is just a sign of power, of authority. It's like a staff king would hold indicating that he is the king. So if somebody walked into the room, you would know who is in charge, who's holding the scepter, who has the power. So the coming of Jesus Christ, it's again foretold, right? But this time he says that he would smite and destroy in Moab, right? Ezekiel tells us the same thing about Moab, what God will do to them. But, you know, here, this is God indicating that there will also be the pouring out of God's wrath at a point in the last days when the Lord comes. And listen, some Old Testament prophecy is no... is is no longer really known because a lot of it was e either verbally understood or it was passed verbally along and God did not record it in the Bible. You know, some preaching was remembered from generation to generation for hundreds of years. And, you know, what God has given us is sufficient, but there was preaching that was remembered for hundreds and hundreds of years that we don't have in the Old Testament. In 2 Timothy 3, he says, know this also, in the last days, perilous times shall come and he begins de describing the type of people that we will see in the last days and then he ends up saying now as janus and jambres withstood moses so do these also resist the truth men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith right so that warning that, that he gives us there is people that are called reprobates they're rejected of god but then he indicates well just like janus and jambres resisted moses well guess what we don't have those names in the old testament but we know by context, this is talking about the false prophets, the magicians that worked miracles for Pharaoh, who was also a reprobate, right? So, but, but so we can learn, well, how, how was it he knew that? Well, the Lord revealed it to him. It was verbally passed on. You know, God wanted it in the New Testament, but it's not in the Old Testament. 
You think also about Enoch. You know, the Bible, Jesus told us about the days of Lot and the days of Noah. We can study that. We can see just how wicked the world was. Right? Hey, take a look outside. Take a look at the news. You'll see the days of Lot and the days of Noah. Right? But we're also in Jude. He tells us, he says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You think about it. What Enoch said was known to these men and maybe there's a reason God didn't want it in the Old Testament because the disciples were probably aware of this prophecy. He's coming to judge. But Jesus came to die. Right? He came to pay the price for our sins. So that's why he had to instruct his disciples yet about the second coming. About how in the last days there's, there's multiple times that God comes to the earth and does things. He says these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. They would rather, oh, look at this guy, he's so, oh, he, you know, that's how, that's how the false preachers of today are treated. That's how these false prophets, the, the Judaizers, the Zionism, that's how it's treated. People just roll out the red carpet and they bow down to them. Oh, oh we know the prophecies yet to be fulfilled. And they use prophecy that has been fulfilled at the first coming. And, you know, Jude warned of this very thing. And yet God chose not to put that warning until after his first coming. Think about that. Adam was the first man. Time began. Seven generations later, what that preacher preached is relevant to today. God's word is timeless. God does not change. Neither, neither does his message change. But our understanding changes over time. There are things I see in the Bible and they're like, well, I don't know what this means, but I know what everything else means. So I'm not going to let the, the mysterious cause me to stumble at what has already been revealed. And it's clear that God will judge the earth. He will judge sinners. He will pour out his wrath on the earth. And it will, I mean, you think about the people that have received the mark of the beast when he begins to pour out his wrath. They're going to know it's God. They're going to know why he's doing it. And in their heart, because they've rejected God, because they're a reprobate, they will still hate God. They will not repent. They will not change their mind. So it's cool that there are many things that are, that are recorded and revealed for us today. Isaiah 2, it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the mountaintops, right? God is going to bring new Jerusalem down. God is going to set up his kingdom on this old earth. God has a plan that we don't entirely understand. It says it will be exalted above the hills and nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Right in my father's house are many mansions. We know in John 14 that God has a promise for us. God will reward us and we're living in the last times. Now listen, people use that phrase as if to say, well, it could happen at any moment, right? This whole eminency conspiracy, right? The Zionists want you to build the Antichrist kingdom, so they've deceived people into believing that Jesus can come back at any moment. But from the beginning, God was clear. There are things that must happen first before the Lord resurrects the saints. Listen, there are many things that have to happen before that. We just read them in Matthew 24. Isaiah 2, where I left off, he says, And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. God will judge the earth after the resurrections. He says, They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. After God's done judging, he's going to put to, to silence, he's going to put to quiet the war mongers. And there will be peace on the earth that thousand years. We will rule and reign with him. And I ask you today, where, what status would you like to have? Well, I'm fine being a private. How about a captain? How about a king? How about a priest? How about you start living like you know for a fact that this body doesn't matter, this life doesn't matter, everything you have will burn one day, and one day God will reward you based on what you do right now. Start acting like your soul will last forever somewhere. Start acting like you actually care that God will reward you and He's commanded you to fight in this battle. This is spiritual warfare. Are you opening your mouth and preaching the gospel? Because that is the indication of the end times when people actually go back to preaching the gospel. A revival of preachers across the world. We need some of that. God's wrath in the, in the end times has been prophesied here. And, you know, there's too many, there's way too much prophecy to cover in the minor and the major prophets. I won't get into that this morning. 
Uh, but you're in Deuteronomy chapter 4. I want you to find verse number 30. Thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days. If thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shall be obedient unto His voice. Right? He's saying, hey, at the end of the world, there's going to be tribulation. Right? But you can turn to Jesus. You can be saved. Now, if you're speaking to religious Judaism, they need to turn from the Talmud. They need to reject that antichrist, satanic religion, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the next verse. For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he sware unto them. So he's saying there's a time of trouble coming before the second coming. And, you know, I'm going to step back. We're going to look at this in context. Take a step back to verse number 23. Deuteronomy 4, verse 23. It says, Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God. Now we're studying Timothy, and we just read last week, take heed unto yourself and unto your doctrine. Right? Pay attention to what you, you are doing, how you, you are growing spiritually, your family. And sometimes we get too busy worrying about the world or what's going to impress our friends or even helping. Sometimes you get too worried about helping other people and you neglect your own doctrine. Listen, hey, we are a soul winning church. We went soul winning before we had a preaching service. Our church, yes, it's about the congregation, it's the assembly, it's the singing, it's the preaching, it's the prayer. But before we did any of that, we went soul winning. We went and preached the gospel, right? That's our job. And keeping that in mind, you know, that don't ever have that focus. But don't be so worried, well, you know, I need to read the Bible. I haven't read it all week, but I'm going to go soul winning instead. Whoa. Whoa. You need to be reading the Bible for yourself. You need to be studying out doctrines for yourself. Take heed unto yourself and unto your doctrine. Look how he says it here in verse 23. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. So here he's warning them about idolatry. And we're going to see here that there is actually a warning of end times idolatry. And you may say, well, I don't see idolatry in America. How about the Statue of Liberty? Right. Right? How about the television? Yeah. Right? Covetousness is idolatry. How about a bunch of selfish people that have rejected the covenant of God, they've rejected the free gift, and they make God in their own image? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the God that I like, he just, you know, butterflies and rainbows and unicorns, no hell. Well, guess what? You've made an idol. Right? That's wicked as hell. Look at the next verse. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Hey, Oprah Winfrey, that witch, that daughter of the devil, she doesn't like the fact that the Bible says that God is jealous over you, that God doesn't like you. Oh, well, maybe we'll try this God or that God or this religion. No. There is but one God, the God of the Bible. Oprah Winfrey is a reprobate. She will burn in hell. She is a false prophet. She is a wicked person. Right? Don't listen to her advice. She is the false prophet that Jeremiah warned us about that tried to steal your heart from God. Try to steal you away from the words of God and convince you of something else. Look at verse 25. When thou shalt beget children and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, thou corrupt yourselves and make a graven image or the likeness of anything and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger. So you guys saying, hey, I know you're my, my people, right? But you're going to be in the, in the land that I've given you and then you're no longer going to be my people because you start serving other gods, right? People that worship the devil are not God's people. This should be a no-brainer. Children of God, children of the devil. There's a fight for the people in the middle. That's why we go soul winning. Hey, and that's why the devil has Hollywood. And that's why the devil uses music to pump just garbage into people's minds. To pollute them and defile them and tell them, be selfish, do what you want. Queer is okay. No, it's not. It's filthy. It's reprobate. It's disgusting. They're molesters. Look, and, and that's idolatry in America. It's covetousness. These fake gods. Look at verse 26. I call heaven and earth to witness against the day that ye shall soon utterly perish 
from off the land, whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it, ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. God is saying in this prophecy, He's like, hey, I know what you're going to do. I know you're going to worship other gods. I will judge you. I will take you out of the land. You're not going to stay in there forever. Listen, the land promises were conditional of no other gods. They should be a new no-brainer, but most Christians today can't figure that out, right? The land was conditional of no other gods. Hey, salvation is through God only, right? right? But you can't have Buddha and Jesus Christ. It's no other gods, right? right? The promise that, you know, there was spiritual salvation to some people that didn't ever have the land. There were people in the Old and New Testament that came from other nations that believed on God. They got saved, and they were never in the land. And yet the flip side of that coin, there were people in the land, well, my bloodline this, my religion that, but in their heart, they never had spiritual salvation because they didn't believe the covenant. They didn't believe the promise. Look at the next verse here, verse 27. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But if from thence, right, once you serve these gods, he says, I know what you're going to do. You're going to serve these lowercase g gods, right, which are a bunch of stinking devils, right? He says, you're going to serve these devils, but your people, while the people are there, guess what? That next generation, the children will get saved. The parents are rejected. The children will get saved. Look at the next verse. He says, from thence, Thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, and thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Right? This makes me think of Matthew uh, 6, 33 and 7, 7. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Right? Here's a promise. Seek God, you will find him. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. God has made a promise. If you want to go to heaven and you're honest about it in your heart, you're seeking out of a true heart, you will be saved. You will hear it, and if you believe it, it's still up to you, right? There are people that I think that are seeking, and then they find the answer, and it's not the answer they're looking for. What, what happens at that situation? Well, you've rejected the answer. Hey, guess what? It's a free gift. No, I feel I should pay something for it. Well, then you've rejected the free gift. You've rejected that promise, that covenant. Look at verse 28 again, where he says, Ye shall serve God's the work of his hands, wood and stone. Right? I'm going to talk about idols for a second. Turn, turn to the next chapter, chapter number 5, Deuteronomy 5. So these idols, uh, are, it's like the wrong stone. Right? They take a stone, they carve it up, they make a God, they say, this is my God. And that's kind of what happens with people when we preach the gospel to them. And they reject it. They make their own gospel. They find their own way. They're going to make their own covenant. In Deuteronomy 31, it says, Evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke Him to anger through the work of your hands. Right? Through the work of your hands, you're going to provoke God to anger, and God will judge you. And there will be an end times idolatry. And as a soul winner, as a gospel preacher, you go out and talk to people, and you find out most people today are trusting in their own works. Right? Here the Bible saying, you make a God of the works of your own hand. Today, you go out and knock on somebody's door, and what are you, what are you gonna, how are you going to get to heaven? And it's, well, I think I'm pretty good. I, I think I'll make it. I'm trying really hard. I'm a good person. I go to church. I feed the poor. I give money. I repent all the time. I ask for forgiveness every night. Hey, that's your own works. That is not salvation. That's not biblical. And when they're trusting works for salvation, and here in the Old Testament, God gives us a comparison of an idol is when you make something out of the works of your hand. Listen, most people's gospel is really an idol. Right. right? It's not the gospel at all. Think about this. They're trusting their own covetousness. They're trusting their own idolatrous view of God, and they're rejecting the gospel. Right? Imagine if you preach to somebody, and they hear the gospel, you give them all the verses, they hear exactly what it says, and they say, yeah, no, thank you, have a good day. Well, wait, what, what are you doing? Did you hear it? Don't you know? Don't you see it? You have to make a choice. Won't you call on the Lord and believe Him and receive that gift? No, you know, like I said before, I just think my God doesn't have hell. My God lets everybody in. 
Well, you've taken the gospel and you've turned it into an idol. You're going to make your own gospel and say, this God that I've made, that will do for me. And that's exactly what the children of Israel did. They see God, they see the miracles, they see all the working he's doing, and what do they do? Well, I'm going to take a rock and I'm going to sharpen it up and make a little guy and I'm going to say, this guy is my God. Right? That's what people do when they change the gospel, when they reject it and say, no, I believe something different. You're making an idol in your mind. Listen, Romans 1, 23, it says, And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Well, wait, Romans 1, that's the reprobate passage. They're talking about people that have rejected God. Are idols unforgivable? No, I wouldn't say that, but I think it would be an indication of what's going on in the heart. When somebody rejects it and rejects it, no, I've got my own way. Well, there is but one way. I know, but i got my own way. You've made an idol. Right? You've, your doctrine is an idol. We have to consider someone's heart. Are they asking? Are they seeking? Or are they rejecting? No, I got my own way. And listen, the end of the world, the end times, we're going to see a bunch of idolatry. And, it's not, and I'm not just talking about the Buddhists and, and the Catholics. Listen, there's an idol sitting in most people's living rooms. Right? It's the covetous machine. Right? The one-eyed God that tells them what they want, what they think, what they like, who they should hang out with, what is acceptable, what is morality. Right? That's the idolatry that America is, is primarily guilty of. Look, you're in chapter 5. I want you to see this. Verse number 7. These are the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 5, verse number 7. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Right? Salvation is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. No one else. Not yourself. Not Buddha. Not Maitreya. Not, I mean, just Jesus. Just God. Anything else. Well, I've got two gods. Well, I, I believe in Jesus, but he just opened the door and now I have to work my way through. Now I have to do my works to get my... Hey, that's the works of your own hand. Right? You're making it an idol. Look at the next verse, verse 8. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Right? Uh, well, no, my God, he's kind of like Christianity, but I, I make him in the likeness of, of Muhammad. Of the Buddhists, we just love everybody. Even the bugs, we don't eat meat. What? <laughs> you worship cows, right? You're starving to death and you got a cow sitting there. Why don't you eat that meat? Right? Think about it. Well, I, my, my version of Christianity is Republican only. Well, I'm sorry, that's wicked as hell. That's warmongering. You know, listen, God says we should be liberal in the distribution of the saints. All right? We should be taking care of the ministry. We should be going out preaching the gospel. The politics are always going to be devilish. I don't care if they have an R or a D or an L or what they have. I don't care if it's Constitution Party. Those candidates are all messed up also. They're selfish. They're setting themselves up. Look at the next verse here, verse 9. It says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation unto them that hate me. Hey, those that hate God and reject His gospel and they want to set up their own God and they want to make an idol of their own version of what they believe, God hates that. God hates that. And it will cause a curse to your children if you teach them that. Turn to Deuteronomy 27. Listen, you think about it because he talks about idols made of stone. They got the wrong stone. They got the wrong rock. They're taking a rock. They're chipping it up. They're forming it in their own way. That's their gospel. That's their idol. Hey, Jesus is the rock of our salvation. right? The stone which the builders rejected. That spiritual rock that was Christ. That's the rock of my salvation, right? You know, and, and we were warned in Deuteronomy 4 that they, they will serve God's the work of man's hands. In the end times, idolatry, there's going to be false gods. And it's like carving a stone with the hands of man. It's called works salvation. Right. Work salvation is idolatry. Romans 1.25, who changed the truth of God to lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Well, I had the gospel, but I, my way is... No, your way is wrong. Your way is rejection of God. God will reject you for having your own way. Look at Deuteronomy 27, verse 5. This is, we're going to see this. It'll be very prominent and prevalent in the end times. Look at verse 5. And there shalt thou build an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones. Thou shalt not lift up any tool, any iron tool upon them. Now, I think there's some symbology in here. That Christ is that stone. He's that right? 
And here he's saying, don't put a tool on that stone. When they built an altar, when they were going to sacrifice to the Lord, you didn't carve that stone up. You didn't grave that stone. But he's warning, I'm going to kick you out of the land for graving images, the works of your hands. Right? This works gospel. Exodus 20, he says, And if thou wilt make thee an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Works gospel has polluted America today, and it's a sign of the end times. Jesus has warned us that there's going to be a lot of idolatry. And another end times idol, a false god, a stone carved of the hands of men, will be the Antichrist. Right? People are going to worship the Antichrist as God. Listen, we may see it in our life. And I'm not a, it can happen any minute guy, because that's not true. Right? Hey, it could happen in three years or so. Right? If it kicked in and all of a sudden the Antichrist is revealed and things begin to happen and we all see this, even the people that believe in eminency, they're going to correct themselves real quick when they see this man elevating himself, calling himself God. And yet at the same time, your friends and your family, there'll be a great falling away. Well, no, this guy, he is God. No, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? You're making God into another image. You're, you're, you're hewing that stone into something that it's not. Right? Zechariah 11, it says, Woe unto the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock, the sword shall be upon his arm, and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. The idle shepherd, talking about the Antichrist, talking about the devil's rule and reign. Why does God hate idols so much? Because that means it's not just one God. That means you're not just saying, I believe in the God of the Bible, I believe in the God of the Bible, and this guy, and that guy, and this thing, and my way, and his way, and whatever's easy and convenient. That's not true. Listen, the gospel is easy, right? Jesus' burden is easy, it's light, it's simple to be saved, but it comes down to the status of your heart. Are you seeking? Are you asking? When you're presented with the truth, do you believe it and receive it? Or do you say, no, I want, so that's not, I mean, then I have to stop hanging out with my friends that are ungodly. Well, then I have to admit that grandma's dead and in hell right now because she was a Catholic. Many people will not change their own heart because of a selfish desire to like be a legend in their own mind, or our family is right, or my friends. I just like hanging out with my friends and doing my thing, and I know that if I believe the gospel right now, I'm going to have to stop. Listen, that still works salvation. You don't have to stop living ungodly to be saved. You ought to, or God will correct you. So of this idle shepherd, God calls him an idle shepherd, he says that his, his uh, eye, right eye and his arm will be clean dried up, indicating a wound. In Revelation 13, it says that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by the sword and did live. It says he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. We know he's talking about how these false prophets, the Antichrist, they set up the, what's called the abomination of desolation. What Daniel the prophet said, the abomination that maketh desolate. They set up an idol, people worship it, it's an image they have power to make speak, supernatural, technologically, I don't know how they do it, right? But either way, it's going to happen, and people, it's an idol, it's another God. They're going to set it up and say, this is God, this. God calls it an abomination, something he hates. God loves you, he died for all of your sins. God hates idols, God hates work salvation, God hates the Antichrist. And listen, as Christians, how do we respond to all this? Turn back to Matthew 24. Right? In Colossians 3, it said, Covetousness, which is idolatry. Why do people make up a false gospel? Why do people reject the free gift and say, I'm going to try to do something impossible? I'm going to try to stop sinning? Because they're covetous in their heart. They're not honest in their heart with God. They reject that gospel. And listen, this selfish, worldly rejection is all around us. There is but one way. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the end times, we're warned about idolatry over and over, especially in the Old Testament. We get into the New Testament and we see it and we think, well, that doesn't really apply today. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Idolatry, idolatry is still all around us. Listen, in Job 19, he says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God whom I shall see for myself, mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Job was saying, I know this body's going to die, but I know I'm going to get a new body. I will be resurrected. I will see God. I will see my Savior. Hey, that will come upon us one day. And there are other things that will happen after that. All throughout the Old Testament, there was prophecy 
telling about this, warning about it, promising us eternal reward. Look here in Matthew 24. We're going to end with this. Look at verse number 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. There's your Antichrist. There's the first seal you see in Revelation chapter 6. Look at the next verse. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. Listen, don't have a bug out mentality. Oh no, did you hear that Russia? Did you know Iran? Who cares? God's in control. Hey, there's war in the streets of America. It's okay. Be calm. Go soul winning. That's right. Be a man of God. Have some backbone to you. Have some strength in your spirit. Look what he says. Where are we at? Be not troubled. Verse 6. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famine and pestilences and earthquake, earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Right? We've got the, the seals 2, 3, and 4. We see we've got wars, rumors death, pestilence, all these things happening, right? In Revelation, it tells us a quarter of the earth will be destroyed. One-fourth of earth's population will die in this time. And then what happens? The fifth seal, right? What's called the Great Tribulation, when Christians are killed for believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and rejecting this Antichrist. Look at verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's are Christians hated right now? Oh, yeah. yeah. Now listen, there's the fake Christianity, but when the Antichrist and they fall away, they will no longer claim to be Christians anymore. People, it will blow our mind like, well, I thought that guy's always been a Christian. No, he was never a Christian. He always had an idol in his heart. He always had his own way. He rejected the easy way. He rejected the free gift. He said, well, I have to do the works. Imagine all these Calvinists, all these Pentecostals, because they're not saved, they will follow the Antichrist. They will fall away. Look at verse 14. And this gospel, kingdom, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall come the end. Oh no, the world's going to hell. People are dying. They've killed my family. What do I do? Go preach the gospel. Open your mouth boldly with the power of the Holy Spirit try to save the souls that are left in the middle listen children of god they're saved once saved always saved the neutral people the unsaved children of the world this is what it's all about god needs us to get them saved god's not going to miraculously manifest himself and get them saved he wants us from faith to faith preach the gospel to them why because the devil the antichrist the reprobates the son of the devil these children of the devil the children of the wicked one they're trying to pull them over to their side once they get the mark of the beast, there's no going back. Right? There are certain things you cross the line with God. He's like, you're done. You're done. Your soul will never see redemption. Look at verse 15. And when ye therefore shall see the abomination spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Right? We will see this abomination, this idol. And yet, it'll play right in with, hey, where's the holy place today? Hey, my, this is my temple, right? God says my body is a temple. His spirit is inside of me. And what's a child of the devil? Well, it's not a holy place, right? But they're going to have an abomination. They're going to have an idol in their heart. These people, not only will we physically see this idol, this abomination, but people will have an idol of false gospel in their heart. The works salvation. That's the fifth seal, persecution. Look at verse 29 to look at the sixth seal. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory that's the same thing jesus said in acts he said i'm coming back with clouds Back in, in like manner I leave, I'm coming back. In power, in glory, only this time, as Jesus is telling the, these words right now, 
He's here on his first visit. He's saying, my second visit, I'm coming back to set up my kingdom. I'm coming back to resurrect your soul. And then he, says, he begins to do the things, pouring out his wrath. Look what he says, verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other end. That's that gathering together that Genesis 49 told us about. In the last days, we're going to be gathered together. We see it in 2 Thessalonians 2. We see it in Matthew 24. God has made you a promise. This body obviously cannot even go to heaven. This body can never be righteous. It can never be perfect. It will not stop sinning. However, your soul will be sealed unto redemption. When you put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's supernatural. Your soul and your spirit will go somewhere forever. The choice is yours. And as Christians, the job is ours. The responsibility is ours. The duty is ours to open our mouth, to preach, to let people know. It's not just a social club. We don't just come here to hang out and pat each other on the back. We take God's word very seriously. He's given us warning. He loves us. Jesus ended that chapter. He said, blessed is that, is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Listen, men of God. Listen, ladies. Listen, children. Grow up with the mentality of what was taught in Genesis 49 in the first book. And in Malachi, the last of the Old Testament, and in Revelation, that God is coming back. What you do in this body will last forever. Don't you want to be rewarded of God greatly? And it's up to us. When somebody says, well, we're not really in the end times. Hey, we've been in the end times for a long time. Okay? Jesus has things that are yet fulfilled. He fulfilled the first. It's evidenced by His Holy Spirit. He was seen by thousands. And now it's up to you to help do what he wants as, as time progresses, as we get closer to the end. So let's keep that in mind. The Bible is taught from the beginning about the ending. The disciples knew, and yet today a lot of Christians don't even know. Study your Bible. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the awesome prophecy that's in, in the Bible, Lord, the scriptures, things that you want us to know. Lord, thank you for not just always being dark and mysterious and keeping things from us. Lord, thank you for revealing things so that we understand, so that we know what to do. Lord, you've shown us what we need to do. Now I pray that you would help us to take these things, commit them to our heart, and change our lives and work for you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the free gift of salvation. I ask you would bless the people that are here today and keep them safe as we leave. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.